Hi, hello there friends, it's Emma here, the Bookish Princess. In today's video, we're gonna talk about Disney World, but a different side of Disney World from what you usually see in my travel vlogs. Today, we're looking at some of the real life personalities and real life people who are woven into Disney World. These might be places, restaurants you've been to, you visited, and you didn't even know there was a namesake and a story behind it. When my family travels in the real world, as opposed to Disney World, we love to find things that are like, oh, that's like at Epcot, that's like at the Magic Kingdom. Sometimes it's a bit of a stretch, but sometimes it actually is the real inspiration. So let's get to it. I should probably say before we get into this list that I've kind of disqualified like anything about Disney himself or Disney animators because obviously there are lots of fun nods to Walt, to his family, all of the windows along Main Street are like kind of uh, hidden references, Easter eggs to the animators, people from the Disney company. But what we're looking at today are figures from outside the Disney milieu who have made their way into Disney and I think add such a magical touch. There's really only one place we can start this journey and that's at the Animal Kingdom Lodge. I feel like of all the resorts and all the spots of Disney that pulls the most inspiration from outside from the real world because of course that resort is filled with art and masks and instruments from tribes all over Africa all sorts of different cultures they're so beautiful it really is like a museum you wander down the hallways and like in every elevator bank there's a different theme that they explore lots of different cool things to look at there's that beautiful incredible mask that's kind of the showpiece of the lobby there's just so much real life inspiration behind the animal kingdom Kingdom Lodge. But one of my favorite spots has to be the Sunset Lounge. If you head into the lobby just past the check-in desks, it's just off to your left. This beautiful cozy little nook. There's an overlook for the Sunset Savannah. Of course, it's beautiful at sunset because you have all the light coming in. It's a great place to cozy up with a book. And in fact, you'll notice there's a book in one of the cases in the Sunset Lounge. It's actually this book right here. I mean, not this exact copy. I didn't break it out of the case. I just went on ABE books and got my own. This is I Married Adventure by Osa Johnson. When you explore the Sunset Lounge more, you'll notice there are lots of interesting artifacts and lots of gorgeous photos of Africa, and they are by Osa and her husband, Martin. I had never heard of Martin and Osa before the Sunset Lounge, but I definitely was intrigued by the book. Also, there's a photo of Osa with like her arms full of cheetah cubs and perfect lipstick. Martin and Osa are not very well known today, but back in their time in the 20s and 30s, if you said their names, everybody would have known who it was. They're basically the world's first travel vloggers, and I mean that basically literally. Martin fell in love with cameras when they were invented, when he was just a teenager. He got to know how to use them. He actually went on a voyage with Jack London to the South Pacific, and he of course used his camera, took lots of photos. When he got back to Kansas, he exhibited them. They had this really cool kind of not a movie hall because I'm not even sure motion pictures were around yet, but they built it to look like um, the Snark, I think was the name of the ship. When he was back home in Kansas, Martin met Osa, they got married, and then the rest of their lives together were one adventure after the next. They went back to the South Pacific, they went to Africa. I love their pioneering spirit because every time there was a new invention or something that could add more to their pictures, they, they embraced it and learned it. So once moving pictures became a thing, of course they were taking movies. Once sound was added to pictures, they added a sound guy to their crew. When airplanes became a thing, they realized, oh my gosh, we could get some amazing pictures from the air and it wouldn't take nearly as long to get to these remote places. Reading about their expeditions, you know, with trucks and porters is kind of crazy that they managed to get to these places and get these incredible pictures with all the challenges standing in their way. As soon as planes were available, they of course took flying lessons, bought two planes. One of the planes had zebra stripes like this and the other had giraffe spots. 
kind of awesome. So it turns out there's a Martin and Osa Safari Museum in Chinook, Kansas, where the Johnsons are from. After I posted about this book on my Instagram, they reached out to me and it's been so much fun to connect. They've sent me some pictures and just so much fun to learn more about Martin and Osa. They sent me this book, Four Years in Paradise, which is when the Johnsons moved to Kenya for four years. They, there was this remote lake, Lake Paradise, which was kind of just a legend. Like people didn't know if it really existed, but of course Martin and Osa had to go find it and then they moved out there and like built a whole little village and lived there for four years and got these absolutely incredible photos. The museum also sent me some of their movies. I think you can find some of their footage on YouTube too, but oh my gosh, it's just incredible. Like they obviously had such a great artistic eye and the footage is just spectacular. When the Imagineers were designing the Animal Kingdom Lodge, they actually watched Martin and Osa's films for inspiration. In fact, in one of the movies, um, Babuna, there's, um, you know, Martin and Osa are visiting a tribe and you can see their beautiful, beautiful shields and they look almost exactly the same as the shields on the doors and on the chandeliers at the Animal Kingdom Lodge. Like even the designs look super similar. I'm actually kind of surprised Martin and Osa and Walt never teamed up to do anything together because they did live really around the same time when Martin and Osa's motion pictures were so popular. It would have been when Walt himself was starting up his animation business. And of course, Walt grew up and lived in Kansas City and the, the Johnsons were from Kansas. They really do feel like kindred spirits though. They have that same sense of adventure, that same sense of like quirkiness, like no one else is doing it, but you know what? We're gonna go and try it and do it. I feel so grateful that the Imagineers put them in in the Sunset Lounge because otherwise I would never have heard of Martin and Osa and I just think they're such fabulous personalities. I've loved reading their books and watching their movies and I'm definitely planning on reading more. They actually just recently came out with a new um, paperback of uh, I Married Adventure. It has the fabulous zebra stripes. They don't sell this at Zawadi yet. I'm pretty sure they don't at least. They obviously should. But if you are curious about the Johnsons and would like to read these books, I have very good news over on my Instagram, Bookish Princess. I'm actually hosting a giveaway. The Martin and Osa Museum in Kansas sent me a note and said, would you like to give away some of the books to your followers? And I said, oh my gosh, that would be so much fun. So they actually sent me two sets of these. So there'll be two winners. I'll post all the details about how to enter in the description below. But if you head over to instagram.com slash bookish princess, you should see the post there and you can enter there. And then on your next trip to the Animal Kingdom Lodge, you can take these to the Sunset Lounge and read them. The inspiration to make this video actually came from an email exchange with the museum. The curator was saying, are there a lot of other personalities like Martin and Osa at Walt Disney World? And I thought, hmm, that's a good question. Martin and Osa and the Animal Kingdom Lodge were definitely the first examples to come to mind. But then I was thinking and I thought, well, the boardwalk has a lot of real life inspiration too. Disney's Boardwalk Resort is of course based on the popular seaside towns, Coney Island, Atlantic City. Um, so it's really got that same feel. When you walk around the resorts, there are tons of old fashioned photographs, old fashioned postcards, which are so fun to look at because you're on vacation with your family at Disney. But here's all these mementos of families vacations from the early 1900s. From a hundred years ago, there were of course lots of spectacular performers at the real life boardwalk. And one of them who has made her way to Disney's boardwalk is Sonora. Laura Webster Carver. She was actually a horse diver. I know, I didn't even know this was a thing. She would ride the horse, they would dive off. I think that was like 40 or 60 feet. I somehow don't think you would really see this act around today, but the horses actually were never harmed in all the years they did this act. Sonora herself, unfortunately, went blind after a bad dive. Her eyes were open, um, but she continued to ride the horses and do the dives for at least a decade after that. I actually just discovered that Sonora has a book called A Girl and Five Brave Horses, so I'm obviously adding that to my TBR list, and we'll have to read it at the boardwalk sometime. Now, Sonora sadly doesn't have a whole little corner, little lounge the way the Johnsons do, but I'm pretty sure in the conference center. There's like a nice photograph of her or a painting of her, like a little plaque. I'm like 99% sure of this. Obviously the next time we go, I'm gonna need to go to the conference center to like confirm this. However, you'll also see her name up in the club level because one of the big suites at the boardwalk is called the Sonora Suite. I wonder if they have something for Sonora in the suite. I've never stayed in that fancy suite, so I couldn't tell you. <laughs> I'm trying to think if there are any other famous performers who also get nods at Disney's Boardwalk, like Houdini. I feel like there should be more of them. That would be really fun. So for our next real life personality, we're heading to the Wilderness Lodge. This one, 
Am I cheating? I may be cheating a little bit because Sonora and the Johnsons like have photos of themselves, have the plaque there. This one, it's a little bit more of a stretch. It's not the woman herself, but one of her ideas has come to life at the Wilderness Lodge. If you've ever visited the Grand Canyon, you'll know who Mary Coulter is. When my family visited the Grand Canyon, I loved getting to know her. Mary Coulter was actually a designer and architect for the Harvey Company, you know, the Harvey House hotels that were all along the railroad. See, if my family lived back then as opposed to right now, we wouldn't be able to go to Disney World, obviously, but I think instead we would have traveled along the railroad and we would have hit up all of these beautiful hotels. Unfortunately, a lot of them aren't around anymore, but the ones that are are just absolutely stunning. And it's so cool to see the photos of them because the designs, they fit perfectly into nature. There are some buildings still left at Grand Canyon Village. So there's Hopi House, the Lookout Studio, the El Tovar. They have some Mary Culture designs in the dining room at the El Tovar. We um, had breakfast at the El Tovar and I could not resist getting one of these to add to my teacup collection. They should totally have these at the Wilderness Lodge, I think. It would definitely fit the aesthetic. So where is Mary Coulter at the Wilderness Lodge? Well, when you enter that lobby, it is absolutely stunning. Oh my gosh, timbers, soaring, carvings. And then in the corner, this stunning stone fireplace. It's modeled after the Grand Canyon, so all the geologic layers actually mirror the real geologic layers at the Grand Canyon, but the Imagineers were not the first ones to think of that. Our girl Mary Coulter first came up with that idea. She actually did incorporate a kind of abbreviated version of a fireplace like that at the Bright Angel Lodge, which is at the Grand Canyon. She didn't have quite as much space as they had in the atrium at the Wilderness Lodge, but I feel like if she could see the Disney version of her, of her vision, she would appreciate it. Mary Coulter's vibe, I feel like, is a perfect fit for the Wilderness Lodge, and they totally should add some little photo of her or like nod to her because they've got her fireplace right there in the lobby. I don't think there is any plaque or anything at the moment, but obviously they should add one. All resorts should have like a cozy little lounge with like something that inspired that resort. That's why I love the Disney Resort so much is that they feel so immersive. They feel like you're not in Florida anymore. You're in Africa. You're out in the Wild West. You're at the Polynesian. We might as well head to the Polynesian next because there are actually two real life inspirations here. With this, they're just the name. Again, no plaque, no photo, sadly. So if you've eaten at the counter service restaurant at the Polynesian Resort, then you'll know Captain Cook. But do you really know Captain Cook? Have you ever thought about the name? Maybe you thought, oh, it's just cooking, like a captain who's a cook. You know, it doesn't mean anything. Oh no, there is a real life Captain Cook, Captain James Cook. He was a British navigator and explorer who lived in the 1700s. He made the first recorded European contact with the Hawaiian Islands. He was really a pioneer in the Pacific Ocean. He created tons of maps. He was the first person to circumnavigate New Zealand. There's a statue of him on Waimea. Sadly, he got into an altercation with the natives and was killed. And actually, one of the people who did him in is the other namesake at the Polynesian, King Kamehameha. King Kamehameha has many statues in Hawaii because he was the first person to unite all the different Hawaiian tribes into one kingdom. I think his uncle or father was the like king of his tribe when Captain Cook came. So it was in 1810 that he united the island into one kingdom. Apparently June 10th is King Kamehameha Day and they deck out all the statues of King Kamehameha with leis in Hawaii. So I somehow feel like somehow they should celebrate King Kamehameha Day at the Polynesian. Of course, all the buildings at the Polynesian are named after different Hawaiian islands, but the club level, which is actually in the Hawaii building, is named the King Kamehameha Club. So the next time you're staying concierge level, you'll know just whose club it is. All right, for the last two items on my list, we're heading to the Grand Floridian. They are like the two at the Polynesian, just namesakes. There's not like an actual photo or plaque. I wish Disney wouldn't be afraid of doing that though, because like with the Johnsons, I love that addition so, so much. And I think there are so many fascinating real life stories out in the world, so many real life stories that the Imagineers use as inspiration when they're creating places at Disney. It'd be fun if they wove more of them in and worked harder to add more of them because I think that's really part of what makes the magic of Disney. I mean, obviously I love Mickey Mouse, I love Tinkerbell, I love the princesses, and those characters are always going to be there, but it's these extra touches that really kind of make Disney what it is. 
it always makes me kind of sad when I see them phasing something unique out and just putting something more generic, more like specifically Disney branded in. For example, they've kind of changed the name of one of these, but we're going with it. So I'm talking now about the counter service restaurant at the Grand Floridian. The name of it now is Gasparilla Island Grill, and there is a Gasparilla Island, but before it was just called Gasparilla Grill and Games. And if you looked at like the logo of the restaurant, the sign above the door, there was a pirate ship, which is very appropriate because the counter service is right off of the marina there. Gasparilla was a pirate. His name was Jose Gaspar. He terrorized the Spanish Main and the Mexican Gulf. One of the last of the Buccaneers. There's actually a pirate festival. I think on Gasparilla Island in Florida. Although when I was looking him up, they were saying that apparently his sort of historical authenticity is in question. Was he just a pirate of legend? Was he actually a real guy? I don't know, but I kind of love that they snuck a pirate into the Grand Floridian. The Grand Floridian is of course the flagship resort at Disney World. It is so elegant, so beautiful, and it's home to the most expensive restaurant at Disney, Victoria and Albert's. This is I think like five stars. It's like one of the most extraordinary restaurants. I sadly have never actually been to Victoria and Albert's. I would love to go someday. It's just so expensive. However, the namesake of Victoria and Albert's I'm sure would have loved eating there. It's named, of course, after Queen Victoria and her husband Albert of England. Since I've never been in the restaurant, I couldn't tell you if there's actually a portrait of, of Queen Victoria and Albert somewhere. There should be. I feel like they're a perfect fit for this restaurant. So, from pirates to British royalty. Well, those were all the real life personalities I could think up. I would love to hear from you guys in the comments. If you can think of anybody else who snuck their way into Disney World, there are, of course, lots of places, lots of books that have also inspired Disney World. So I'm thinking maybe I'll do some separate videos on those. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, make sure you're subscribed so you're in the loop for when new videos are posted. Don't forget to head over to Instagram to check out the OSA giveaway. Until next time, I hope you have a magical day. Bye guys!